Linux isn't for everyone, but Windows isn't for anyone. What I mean by this is Windows is kind of like one of those cheap one-size-fits-all hats that you get at Walmart. It says one-size-fits-all, but in reality, it's kind of more like one size doesn't really quite fit anybody right and doesn't really look that great on anyone. Hey, um, so sit back, relax, get yourself a cup of coffee, and what we're going to do today is we're going to get into some of the ways in which Windows has become more constraining and more user-hostile over the years. See, Windows is a past its prime OS. Many times when people are thinking of comparisons of Windows versus Linux, what they're really thinking of is Windows has as it was in the Windows 7 era, and not how it is now. See, Linux in the 2000s was getting a lot better, but it wasn't really quite there yet, and there were still issues that non-technical users would still run into. Ask me how I know, because I was using it back then, and a great example of this is Broadcom wireless cards was a common issue back then. Doesn't exist at all anymore. Gotten a lot better for that. But Windows XP and Windows 7 at the same time, that were around at the same time as this, those were the two best Windows releases ever. In the 2000s, Linux was getting a lot better, but Windows was in its absolute prime. So let's get a little into the story of Windows, starting with Windows NT. The reason I start with NT is because the evolution of Windows goes a bit like this. Table on screen for those that want it, with free Easter eggs on coming videos. Modern Windows starts with Windows NT 3X, then it goes to Windows NT 4.0, then it goes to Windows 2000 slash NT 5.0, and then Windows XP was a uh, Windows NT 5.X. Windows Vista is Windows NT 6.0. Windows 7 is Windows NT 6.1, and this continues all the way until the coming Windows 12, which we will likely see in the next year or in late next year or 2026. What it does not do is it does not go Windows 95 into Windows 98 into Windows X ME into Windows XP. All consumer versions of Windows before XP are what you call Windows 9X. They are based on a different kernel. And in case you're wondering, the kernel, in short, is what sits between the hardware and firmware in your hardware and the programs that you want to use. And it allows the programs and the hardware to work together. Now, the development of the Windows NT base was one of the best decisions that Microsoft ever made. Despite the mismanagement of Windows Vista, over the course of, two of the 2000s, Windows actually evolved into something relatively mature and stable for a desktop OS. Even Vista was probably better than you remember. Because while its launch was a mess, most of the problems were sorted out. And by 2008, Vista was actually okay. And Microsoft's uh, Mojave project actually demonstrated this. At least it was okay for a Windows pro release. Oh no, I'm praising Windows and I'm supposed to be a Linux fanboy. Please, please send help. Whew, I'm glad. I'm glad I got that out of my system. That, that, that's rough. Those are rough words for a Linux fanboy. This 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 is gonna be a tough video, but we press on. Windows 2000 to Windows 7 is really the golden era of Windows. This goes right from about 2000 to about 2012. Now the reason that I say 2000 and not Windows ME is because for those of you that don't know. Windows 2000 and Windows ME are not the same operating system. Windows 2000 was actually a pretty good Windows release. Windows ME stood for multiple errors and had enough blue screens to make CrowdStrike jealous. Now, Windows XP and Windows 7 are examples, at least as Windows goes. I should preface it with this. At least as Windows goes, they are examples of what you call user-friendly software, as opposed to the later versions of Windows, which are user-hostile software. So let me define my terms here. The way I am using user-friendly in this context doesn't inherently mean easy to use. In fact, easy to use can be a variable thing because easy to use for one person and one purpose doesn't imply easy to use for another person and another purpose. For example, if any of you have ever done a uh, photography 
you'll know that a DSLR camera, a digital SLR camera, is very easy to use for a professional photographer. But it's quite difficult for the average person. There's a lot of buttons, a lot of things that do different things. But a point and shoot camera, while being very easy for the average person to use, is actually very frustrating for a professional because of all the settings being hidden away. So instead, I will define user user-friendly and user-hostile like this. User-friendly software is software that prioritizes the interests of the end user, while user-hostile software prioritizes the interests of the company selling the software. A good example of user-friendly in, in this case is Linux Mint, whose development team has a long history of championing popular opinions in the Linux world, like their opposition to snaps and their development of the Cinnamon desktop. A good example of user Hostile software is Adobe, who makes you pay insane subscription fees for their services and then makes you use the cloud, aka their computer, to store your photos and then has some very questionable privacy policy practices. I want to take a minute actually and get into the cloud computing because it's a really misleading term. You see, when they say cloud computing, you know, let's take a minute and get into this term cloud computing, because cloud computing is one of the most prevalent forms of user hostile software today. See, when they say cloud computing, it's a marketing term that is meant to invoke images of your data just disappearing into the ether to be recalled down by you at will. And in reality, that's not what it actually is at all. Instead, cloud computing would be much better called your data on someone else's computer computing. Oh, that doesn't really quite have the same ring to it now, does it? And do you know what the problem is with your data being on someone else's computer is? It's that they can do whatever they want with it, as long as they don't get caught. And frankly, even if they do get caught, what are you, some random end user, going to do about it? You don't have the money, power, and lawyers that companies like Microsoft and Adobe have. In fact, we're seeing this issue play out in a lawsuit right now, where mid-journey... Stability AI and DeviantArt are all getting sued for using copyrighted artwork in their training data for their AI. It's ongoing right now in the case Anderson versus Stability AI. See, in the computer world, we love to come up with these vaguely cool-sounding technical terms that are really just marketing terms and kind of mean something, but kind of sort of don't really mean anything. If any of you are into guns, think of it how... Magnum gets used in the gun world. Yeah, it kind of means something, but it's also kind of really just a marketing term. Well, it's the exact same way with a lot of terms in the computing world, and cloud is an example of that. See, cloud computing really is just a rebranding of the age-old client-server model, which has been around since, like, pretty much the start of beginning of computing, I think. Except for in the in this case, in the modern use case, your PC is the client and the cloud is the server. So, for example, if you sign up to Adobe and then you get saddled with all of Adobe's, frankly, junk, then your PC is the client and the server is Adobe's PC, which you have to store your data, which you end up having to store your data on. In fact, every time I hear the term cloud computing. I think of Elizabeth Holmes, you know, the Wish.com Steve Jobs, who was the heiress to the Fleischmann fortune and daughter of an Enron executive that for some reason people thought it was a good idea to invest in. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the daughter of the Enron executive is really not going to screw anyone. <sighs> people are idiots. So put a mental note here. Put a mental note right here because I'm going to circle back to this point later. But for right now, I want to take you back to the year... 2012. It's December 21st. You just got off the evening shift. You're having a couple of beers with your girlfriend at the kitchen table and you're kind of half drunk singing, it's the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine. Oh, and Windows 8 came out that year, which went down about as well as the swallow a tablespoon of cinnamon challenge. And by that, I mean... It was likely to either make you choke or commit aggravated assault on your PC. Not great options. The problem with Windows 8 
is that on launch, it was an absolutely buggy mess. It was a rush release. And the other problem is, and the more fundamental problem was, is that it tried to be two things at once and failed at both of them. This is an example of what we would see a lot of with Microsoft in the coming years, where you see a fad come up, Microsoft tries to chase the fad, they their attempt to face the, chase the fad ends up failing, it ends up falling flat on its face, and then they end up ripping out all of the functionality. Now, how this worked with Windows 8 is that Windows 8 tried to be a tablet OS and a desktop OS at the same time. And it ended up being not very good at either. And how they ended up walking back on this was within a couple of years, they released Windows 8.1, which 8.1 did at least address a lot of the bugs. And then Windows 10 came out in 2015, which is actually a fairly short cycle for a uh, Windows release. And that ended up being a complete return to the traditional desktop paradigm. It's a very two steps forward, one step back kind of approach where they end up chasing the fad, then they end up ripping all the functionality back out. You can see many, many other examples of this, including Microsoft Zoom, uh, uh, Windows Phone, and one of the most egregious examples that I'm going to get into here, Cortana. For example, this was reported by the Guardian newspaper in the UK. A Microsoft program to transcribe and vet audio from Skype and, Cont and Cortana, its voice assistant, ran for years with no security measures. According to a former contractor who says he reviewed thousands of potentially sensitive recordings on his personal laptop from his home in Beijing for over two years when he worked for the company. Continuing, they just gave me this login over email and I will then have access to Cortana recordings. I could then hypothetically share this information with anyone, the contractor said. I heard all kinds of unusual conversations, including what could have been domestic violence. It sounds a bit crazy now after educating myself on computer security that they gave me a URL, a username, and a password sent over email. That means that literally anyone that got access to a third party employee's email could listen in on everything Cortana recorded, which was a lot. And remember what I said about cloud computing a minute ago? This is from the Microsoft Forms, where a user asked, Word is forcing me to use OneDrive to save documents that I want saved to my computer. Help! Starting today, Word only gives me OneDrive as the place to save my documents. I cannot save to my computer, nor does the document appear in my recent folder or OneDrive folder. I want to be able to save to my computer, but there are no options to do so. There is, nor is there an option under File. And the response to this question was quite shocking. Quote, OneDrive is not a backup. It's a cloud location of your data. The default installation of Office 365 and its OneDrive component uploads all of the contents of the PC My Documents folders to OneDrive, syncs, and there will be a OneDrive folder in File Explorer containing a cached copy of all OneDrive content. And in Word, etc., the default save location is set to OneDrive. No doc slash data is stored on the PC. And then, if it just you know, so you know it gets worse, there is Windows Telemetry, which according to Comparatech, includes the following under its recorded logging, meaning you can't turn it off. Hardware information, including processor speed, amount of memory available, battery capacity, and hard drive size. Network data, such as your adapter speed plus your IMEI number, and which mobile operator you're with if you're using a SIM card. Event metrics covering things like how many events are dropped or blocked, your percentage of successfully uploaded events, and the amount of time your last of your last upload. State change details including total app uptime, processor time allocated to an application, and how many crashes you've experienced. Accessory data including a list of your connected devices, printers, etc. Microsoft store logs including what you've installed, updated, viewed, launched, suspended, and resumed. Note that this includes model numbers and manufacturers and capacity of any storage devices. Comparatech goes on to detail the optional logging, in-depth system specifications, as well as details on your PC overall, PC's overall health and hardware capabilities. Now that sounds pretty vague. App logs showing which apps you've launched, timestamps, and how quickly they respond to your input. Browser activity logs that show which sites you visit and what you searched for. Notably, this only collects data from Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. 
Great reason not to use those browsers. Enhanced error reporting, which includes, among other things, the contents of your device's memory when the PC or app crashes. Now, depending on the app, this could mean stuff like chat logs, browser history, all sorts of stuff. And we have to talk about the looming disaster that is Windows 11. Like, when they tried to demonstrate it on a Microsoft Engineers PC and it ended up lagging on an i9 processor, the fake hardware requirements, and I mean literally fake because people have gotten it running on far lower hardware requirements by pirating the software. And of course, it's most lovely feature, Microsoft Recall. So for those of you that don't know what Recall is, the idea is, is that Microsoft Recall will screen cap everything that you do on your desktop, store it in a local database, and then use AI as a data aggregate to make this entire database of screenshots of your desktop searchable. So for example, if you were looking at apples and you couldn't remember a particular apple that you saw or where you saw it online, but you wanted to find it again, then what you can theoretically do is go to Microsoft Recall, type in Apple, and it'll show you a screenshot of your desktop when you were looking at that Apple. It takes screenshots of everything you're doing on the desktop continuously. At least for now, though, Microsoft says that this will only run on your local PC, thankfully. I think what made them make that decision was the collective pushback of like pretty much every IT guy ever that has had to deal with end users. Because I don't know about you, but when I first heard about Recall, I had a flash of horror before my eyes about just how much of a nightmare this could end up being. In fact, I think it is going to be a nightmare because I think this is going to be a nightmare because I think in the end, the temptation to uh, profit by shoving more data down into Microsoft's gullet is going to overcome whatever caution that they have had pounded into them from the community reaction. So to clarify, what I think they're going to do eventually is, while it only runs locally right now, I think it's going to, and you have to turn it on, I think in the future it may run on the cloud and it will be turned on by default. And I think that this is going to be driven by the temptation for more profit and that this is going to continue until there is some major data breach at a company that causes a major scandal. And yeah, that probably won't even actually change anything because there's been a million data breaches by now and they just, no one seems to care. Or at least not the government who should. And the reason I think this is because Microsoft has a long history. Microsoft has a long history of boiling the frog, like with OneDrive that we discussed earlier. And this should 100% be illegal. And I don't mean like dumping garbage in the river illegal. I mean like selling crack illegal. You know, illegal as it applies to us poor people. Another tool in the Microsoft toolbox to get your data online is the online Microsoft accounts. Windows 11 does not support local accounts and they're making it increasingly hard on Windows 10. At Windows 10, it's at the point now where if you want to use a local account, then what you have to do is you have to get into the uh, command line at a certain part of the installation and invoke a particular command line tool and then restart and then finally that will let you run the local account for now there they might patch that probably will patch that in the future which this is in stark this is first of all kind of ironic given how many times i've heard well you need to use the terminal all the time on linux bro well turns out now you have to on windows too this is in stark contrast to my experience on linux where the need for online accounts is very is very rare even among applications, and I've never even heard of a Linux distribution requiring an online account. I'm sure there is one, and I'm sure it's somewhere, but it's not in any of the ones that I've used, at least. Maybe Ubuntu does now. I don't know. I haven't used Ubuntu really in years, although I don't even think that one did because I did install it on a VM not that long ago, and it didn't. So to drive home this point, Microsoft makes you set up an online account and store your information online so that you can use your PC even when it's not online. Who owns the computer again? So in conclusion, Windows is a past its prime operating system that has just been steadily getting more and more user hostile since 2012. With the, cur with the current iteration of Windows, Windows 11, very nakedly putting Microsoft's interests 
over the interests of the end user. The end user being you, the person who actually owns the computer. And this is alongside a long litany of failed products and two steps forward, one step back that has been going on since 2009. Now I want to go back to an analogy I made all the way back at the beginning of the video. Windows is the hat that doesn't quite fit anyone. In Windows, you have to do things the way that Windows has decided is the best way for you to do them. Its customization options are very, very limited. Not as limited as Mac, but still quite lit, but still quite limited. To the point where all you have is a few themes, you can kind of move your taskbar a little bit, and you can pick from a couple of applets. Basically, the way Windows does things is, however Microsoft decided is best for your 80-year-old grandma to do them, and you kind of got to do it their way or the highway. And frankly, this doesn't make any sense because different use cases require different workflows. Why should you be stuck using a computer the way your 80-year-old grandma does when basically all she uses Windows for is a bootloader for Facebook? The answer is, is that this doesn't make any sense at all. Imagine if we applied this to cars and you got in a Ford F-150, like an old Ford F-150 with the bench seats in the front. Imagine if you got into one of those and you started like being all like, oh, well, the, uh, the shifter's not in the same place as it is on my Mitsubishi. Well, if we apply the same thing to cars that we apply to operating systems, then yeah, we would just expect this shift to be in the same place on every car, even when it doesn't make any sense. In reality, most people, okay, their reaction would be, well, no duh, the shifter's not in the same place that it is on your Mitsubishi. You're driving a Ford F-150, not a Mitsubishi. There's different design considerations. Like, for example, if you tried to put the shifter in the same place, it would be between the, the legs of the guy that is right next to you on the bench seat. Hmm. Linux has no such issues, and instead you are free to choose the distribution that suits your needs best, and you can configure it in many, many different ways. After all, it is your PC. Why shouldn't you be able to use your property how you see fit? For example, on Linux, if you want a distro that is easy for new users, you have Linux Mint. If you want a distro that is good for old PCs, you can run Arch. If you have kids and you want something for teaching them, you can run Ubuntu, Ed Ubuntu. If you have a Raspberry Pi and you want to tinker, you have Raspberry Pi OS. For all those different purposes, on Windows, you have, well, Windows which doesn't really run very well on old PCs and have fun getting it to work on a Raspberry Pi. I don't think that's going to work out for you. To drive the point home, it is simply this. Linux allows a level of freedom and of specialization that is simply not possible under Windows. I personally believe that this inefficient workflow and user hostile nature is part of what leads apps in Windows to trying to become operating systems onto themselves and suffering from a lot of feature creep. Like for example, uTorrent, and how it went from being a good piece of software that just did torrents back in the day to an absolute monstrosity that even tried to become BLC. This is in stark contrast to the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it well, which Linux, coming from Unix, obviously embraces. This naturally leads to many small programs that all work together in cooperation instead of one massive bloated piece of junk, like what you tend to see on many Windows apps. Also, this lends Linux GUIs to tend to be actually easier to use, as they are focused, more focused on trying to make the system work well as a whole, as opposed to being a clean looking display unit. At the end of the day, Windows is made to be sold, Linux is made to be used. This leads to my next point, the two ecosystems. Using the Windows ecosystem is an annoying and frustrating experience for several reasons. Like the insane amount of bloatware Windows PCs come with, or the ads in the start menu and that seem to litter every application. Not to mention how many apps will want you to install pure junk and how you have to hunt down these applications over half the internet, it seems, and download them from who knows where. Now, I know that this isn't all a complaint about Windows inherently, and theoretically, some of this can happen on Linux too, but I feel compelled to mention it because this is driven so much by Microsoft's decision-making. Just so that this doesn't turn into a gish gallop, 
I'm going to dive a little bit into each point that I made. All pre-installed Windows PCs come with a lot of bloatware, to the point where there are probably hundreds of thousands of YouTube videos about how to remove it. Literally, like, you can hire people at Best Buy to remove it for you. It's that bad of a problem. And I would argue that some of these bloatware programs are so bad that they're basically just pre-installed viruses. Like the McAfee vi virus, I mean software, sorry, that comes pre-installed. Honestly, sometimes the biggest difference between software and a virus is just marketing. And then there's ads in the start menu. This is a well-established fact on Windows 10 and later. And much of the pre-installed bloatware is also basically just ads. Like that little default Spotify app that comes on Windows and doesn't really actually do anything. Lastly, Windows lacks an important feature, and that is package management. Now, it sort of does exist on Windows now under the form of Chocolatey, which is third party, and the Microsoft Store, which is woefully inadequate because of its size and very unreliable nature. This stands in stark contrast with the Linux ecosystem, where you will see a world of difference. Linux will rarely require things to be online, things to be online, like online accounts for locally run applications. There's also almost no ads and minimal bloat. I know that there's going to be somebody that's going to at me, but the Linux bloat is nothing compared to Windows. And the biggest difference is that Linux uses package management. Under Linux, your applications are installed from one central repository that is maintained by your distribution. This makes updating far, far easier and cuts way down on bloat by cutting down on libraries having to be installed multiple times. Lastly, I want to preempt two major criticisms with Linux, that it doesn't work and that you don't need the terminal for everything. Now, what you're going to see on the screen right now is me using Linux Mint. And I got a little news for you. Linux Mint does not need the terminal for everything. In fact, people that say you need the terminal for everything are usually thinking of Linux how it was in the Windows 7 era and not how it is now. Yes, the terminal is a powerful tool and many distros rightly embrace this fact. But with modern distros geared towards new users like Linux Mint, which I also recently done a review on, you rarely actually have to touch the terminal if you don't want to. This is especially true now with the rise of flat packs which often makes installing software from Flathub as easy as a click of a button. While I won't go into too much detail, I think flat packs are great for developers because it makes maintaining programs much easier. This makes porting programs to Linux much easier. And flat packs go a long way to addressing many of the past issues with supporting applications on Linux because they allow developers to support Linux by putting out one official flat pack instead of having to deal with every individual distro. A great example of this is OBS, which I am using. Another criticism is, it just doesn't work with X hardware. In reality, these issues are almost always to do with hardware manufacturers. And in the modern day, these issues are pretty rare, unless you're running some pretty esoteric pieces of hardware, or you have an NVIDIA card, which are usually supported, but because of NVIDIA being dum-dums, and how they insist on doing things their own way, they tend to have issues. One last thing in this video, and I know this is going to be a abrupt shift in tone, but I have to throw this in there before I finish. If you are one of those people that thinks, well, I got nothing to hide, then frankly you are wrong, and that is a weak mentality. You do have something to hide. It is protecting your right as an individual to be the master of your own destiny. You are the master of your destiny, not some corporation that wants to data mine you. So to wrap up this video, while Windows is like a one size fits all hat that is kind of ugly and doesn't really fit anyone very well, Linux is like a slick custom fitted hat that just feels great to wear. So don't forget to like and subscribe and pray every day.